Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary. We're going to start our service with an Advent reading. The third candle we light of Ad- for Advent is the candle of joy. When light shines in the darkness, it gives us joy. The light of Jesus is shining on, on us. Let us rejoice. Isaiah 9, 2 through 3. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. So for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Sing praises to the Lord. With joy you will, um, for he has done glorious, gloriously. Let this be made known on all the earth. Shout and sing for joy in inhabitant of Zion for great is your midst in the Holy One of Israel. Let's pray. Dear God, we rejoice in your coming. Most days we carry many burdens and worry over many things. May we receive the Holy Spirit's gift of joy And may we be found rejoicing at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with us this morning as we celebrate and worship Christ, celebrate his birth this morning. is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the herald prince of peace, hail the son of righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with
seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you once again for gathering with us today here at Calvary. It is great to have you, whether in person or via live stream. Thank you for joining us. I just have a few announcements for you this morning. One, this evening at 6.30, we are going to have a ministry partner forum. So if you are a ministry partner here at Calvary, we would love for you to be either in person or via Zoom. We'll send out the link this afternoon. And the topic of discussion is just feedback regarding the 2021 proposed budget. So if you have questions or comments or need to hear some more information, that'll be the theme of the meeting at 6.30 this evening via Zoom or in person. Pastor Evan, will you tell us about the youth Christmas party? Our Christmas party is this week. If you are a student within 6th to 12th grade, make sure you come wearing an ugly Christmas sweater and a $5 white elephant gift. We'll see you this week at 6 o'clock. Perfect. All right. And uh, you may have gotten the information this week. If not, now's your chance. After some careful evaluation of attendance and capacity limits, we are excited to say that we are going to switch to one service starting next week at 10 a.m. We will still be able to accommodate under a 25% capacity. Uh, we'll be able to maintain distancing and all of those things. And so we believe that it's a safe option and an exciting option to go back to one service starting at 10 a.m. next Sunday. So make your schedule changes. Also on your schedule, Christmas Eve service will be at 4.30 on that Thursday. And so that'll be in person and live streamed as well. So mark that on your calendar to worship at 4.30 on Christmas Eve. Those are all the announcements I have. I want kids to come on up to the carpet because there's a cool Christmas video that I want you to watch before Miss Christina comes up and shares a few things. So find your spot on the carpet and check out this video. In the beginning, before God created the universe and everything in it, his salvation plan was for Jesus to come to the earth. God selected a very special people to be part of Jesus' family. Mary, Jesus' mother, and Joseph, Mary's husband, were part of this special family. It was a family that could be traced back to the great King David, whom God had promised an eternal kingdom, and then to Abraham, through whom God has promised to bless the entire world. But before Mary and Joseph got married, God came to her and shared some astonishing news. God had chosen Mary to be Jesus' mother. God told Mary that she would become pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. When Joseph found out, he was hurt and confused. He didn't understand how Mary could be with child unless she had been unfaithful to him. Heartbroken, Joseph considered breaking his engagement to Mary and quietly ending their relationship. Before Joseph could go through with his plans, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. The angel told Joseph that the child Mary was carrying was from the Holy Spirit, and there was no reason Joseph shouldn't marry her. 
Joseph was amazed and overjoyed by this incredible news. The angel told Joseph that the baby boy would fulfill God's promise to send his people a savior, and the baby should be named Jesus. Mary's baby was the Messiah. The Romans, who were in control of Israel at the time, ordered that everyone under their rule be counted. This meant that Joseph, and a very pregnant Mary, had to take a long and difficult journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The weary couple arrived to find the city overflowing with people who had all traveled to be counted. This presented a big problem for them because Mary was ready to give birth. With the inn full of travelers, Mary and Joseph took shelter in the only place still available, a stable. Next to horses and sheep, the savior of the world was born. Angels sang, and nearby shepherds came to worship the newborn king. On the night Jesus was born, a star shone brightly in the night sky over the stable where Jesus was born. It attracted the attention of a group of wise men called the Magi. The Magi, in wonder of this beautiful sight, followed the star in search of Jesus. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they asked King Herod where they could find the child who was born King of the Jews. Evil King Herod, angry at the idea that someone was trying to take away his power, asked the wise men to continue their search and to let him know where the child could be found so he could worship him. But worship wasn't King Herod's plan. King Herod was plotting to kill Jesus. The Magi followed the star until they reached the town of Bethlehem. Their long and difficult journey came to an end when the star stopped over the place where they found Mary and Joseph caring for the baby Jesus. The wise men bowed down and worshipped Jesus. Despite the humble surroundings, the wise men knew they were in the presence of holiness. They didn't need to find the baby in a palace to know that it was right to give Jesus gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh which were the types of gifts given to kings. In a dream, God warned the Magi and Mary and Joseph of King Herod's plan to kill Jesus. To help keep Jesus safe, the wise men began their long trip home in a different direction than they came, so they wouldn't run into King Herod. Mary and Joseph scooped up Jesus and escaped to Egypt. They stayed in Egypt, until an angel of the Lord appeared in one of Joseph's dreams to tell him that King Herod had died and that it was finally safe for them to return home to Israel. Some years later in Israel, Jesus began his ministry, performing miracles, healing people, and ultimately sacrificing himself to save us from our sins. Right, boys and girls, I want to ask you a few questions here. Um, first, I want to draw your attention to a verse in Isaiah, and that verse is Isaiah 6, 9, and it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now Isaiah, he was a prophet, and he prophesied that Jesus was going to come as a baby into the world to save us from our sins long before he came, long before the story that you just watched on the video, before Mary and Joseph were told by the angel that they were gonna be the parents of Jesus, they were expecting the Savior to come. And so I have a question for you. Let's think about when someone promises you something. If someone promised every day to buy you a pony, think about that, but it never happened, would you still believe that you were getting a pony one day? 
Like each day that went by, you woke up and you're like, okay, is the pony gonna be here today? Is the pony gonna be here today? But it wasn't. What would you start thinking? Go ahead. I would think that it wasn't coming. Yeah, maybe you would. So at first we'd probably continue to believe that it was happening. Each day you'd wake up and you'd think, is today the day I'm gonna get my pony? Is today the day I'm gonna get my pony? And you'd probably be excited and you'd believe the promise at first. And after a couple of weeks, just like you said, you'd probably start asking maybe some questions. When exactly is my pony coming? When exactly am I going to get this gift that you promised me? And after months, this promise might just sound empty to you, like you weren't going to get it. So, you know what, boys and girls, that's kind of how maybe some people might have felt at first, because all the way back in Genesis is when God sending a Savior was first told foretold and it was a really long time and people were waiting and waiting and waiting for this promise they were waiting for the Messiah for nearly all of history and yet those who believed and understood that God is faithful knew and remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about hope and when we hope for things and do you remember what we talked about the word hope meant? Who can share with me? Who can tell me what, they, what the word hope means? Is it believing that we um, are expecting what is told to us is going to happen? Or is it just maybe it will happen, but I don't think so? Which one was it? Who remembers? Maybe it will happen. Mm, you think hope is maybe it will happen? Anyone else have an answer? It will happen. That's right. It's believing with expectation. That's right. And God always fulfills his promises. Just like he sent Jesus into this world to save us from our sins. And right now, we are waiting with hope and expectation for him to come back again, aren't we? That's right. And we can believe that God will always be faithful and always keep his promises. All right, so let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the gift that you gave us of your son who died on the cross for our sins, Lord. And we believe with expectation that you are sending your son again to come back and get us. Help us, Lord, to remember the hope that you, we have in you. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Christina. Kids, you can go back to your chairs, okay? Uh, I have a couple of items for our mission moment this morning. The first one is, uh, you know of our partnership with Hope Gospel Mission. And uh, Friday night, I was invited to be the special guest of one of the members of Hope that attends our church, and we have multiple members. And I got to witness the... Uh, the presentation of awards for completing sections of their uh, goals within the context of the Renewed Hope program for their lives. And I got there a little bit late, and I didn't get a picture of Alana over here, waving her hands, with the awards that she was getting. But I got pictures of uh, everybody else. So let's see, who's up first? Uh, oh, there's uh, Jessica getting her awards, and Jessica's here today right down front. Congratulations. And then next, there's John, and John is over here. And Zach is next to him, and there's Zach getting their awards, okay? And then uh, Elizabeth right down front here. There's Elizabeth. Congratulations. And then Clint. Clint graduated actually one of the whole sections and moved into a second section. And then, graduating from the entire program, 
Mike Holenbeck. I don't know if you've met Mike. He's a complete graduate now of Hope. Yesterday, he moved into his own apartment. Well, it's actually a house right over here on Cameron. And uh, he is uh, working full-time already, and he is going to be joining the next level of discipleship training here at Calvary toward the goal of becoming an active participant in leadership at Calvary. God's doing an amazing work in his life too. So we just want to commend all of you from Hope that are here and thank you for your diligence to bring your life under the authority of Jesus Christ and to live it to serve him with your whole heart. So thank you very much for that. Now, I have one other part of the mission moment today that I want to talk about. Uh, I have been working diligently behind the scenes with Pastor Joshua in India for the creation of our Calvary India Bible School and uh, Bible College. That's the new logo designed by our Indian people for the Calvary Bible College. And I have the first proposal of their theological statement, their training syllabus, and the cost factors. Of course, there's always a cost factor. But we have the incredible opportunity to start a Bible college in Vijayawada, India, for the training up of men and women for church leadership, and men specifically for pastoral responsibilities. There are two ways that you can uh, uh, help, well, there's three actually, that you can help with the cost factor for getting this set up. Uh, the first one is the uh, uh, non-recurring expenses that are needed to purchase all the materials for the Bible college, like fans and tube lights and chairs and tables and a digital projector and blackboards. And the big expense is the beds for up. We're trying to find a place to rent where we can have up to 30 people, 30 students. So we need 30 beds for those 30 students. So there's a, there's a cost, an initial cost of about $5,000 for the purchase of everything we need structurally to create the Bible College. The ongoing expenses for the teaching ministry to pay the leadership and the lecturers and the cost of books and the rent on the building and the electricity and then all the food to feed the students for a year and so on, comes to, now get this, comes to, for one semester, about $3,200 to pay for 30 students and everything. Now, if you don't have $3,200, how about this? You can adopt a student at the Calvary Bible College for $107 a month. And if we had 30 people pay $107 a month, we'd have our Bible College paid for every semester. So will you pray with me? Father, thank you for this incredible opportunity we have through Calvary to be training men and women around the world to serve you in the local church. And that this vision that Pastor Joshua and I have had for over three years now is very near to engagement. And we pray that the people of this church will rise up and say, yes. This is our mission, to spread the gospel throughout the whole world and to train disciples to go and make more disciples. Let us rally around this with enthusiasm and we await your provision. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. So tender and mild. 
unfathomable. Lord, what a night that was, Jesus, when you came to rescue us. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. We celebrate your birth. We celebrate your death and your resurrection, Jesus, for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for the cross, Jesus. Amen.
Father, thank you that uh, that was your prayer before the foundations of the world when the plan was agreed upon by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that the sacrifice for our sin would be paid by the Messiah. And that throughout his years of living, up until the time of his crucifixion, Jesus prayed to the Father, lead me to the cross. And there may be someone here today who is being led to the cross of Jesus Christ, recognizing for maybe the first time in their life that they are a guilty sinner before God and that the sacrifice of Jesus will completely cover that sin and wash it away forever and give them a new life that is eternal. And I pray that today would be their day of decision. And We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, back in October, I... Uh, informed Pastor Josh that he would be responsible for the um, Christmas series and that I would only preach once. Well, I get to do New Year's Eve, or Christmas Eve also. But I am thankful for this privilege today especially to have been selected by God to choose to speak on this subject in studying the gift that God has brought to us that led to the cross. And today we want to focus on the gift that we share. The gift we share. When Pastor Josh originated this sermon and the or this sermon series and the Holy Spirit led him in his mind, it was all going to be based on the first few chapters of the book of Hebrews. Last Sunday God interrupted that and led Pastor Josh in a different direction. We're going to start in Hebrews today, but we're going to conclude with a portion of the Christmas story that emphasizes the point that we have a gift to share. Let me ask you a question. Don't answer it out loud, but just be thinking about it in your mind. What's the best news you have ever received in your life? Think about that news right now in your life. What's the best news you ever received? Maybe it was when uh, Rebecca said yes. I, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it was when uh, somebody said, I'm pregnant. And you received this great, crazy, awesome, wonderful news. So how long was it before you started sharing that news with others? How long did it take after receiving that news that you couldn't wait to tell somebody else about it? 
Now another very important question. How long before you stopped sharing that news because the thrill had worn off? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't expect any of our young mothers here to be walking around telling everybody, I got some great news, I'm pregnant. <laughs> that is old now. It doesn't apply anymore. But what about news that still applies to you? That was such great news that you had to tell everybody. Are you still telling them? Or has the thrill worn off? In, book, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 and verse 14, we read these words about this person of Jesus Christ who was God's gift to us. And it says this, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him, who appointed him. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. What an incredible statement of good news. We have come to share in Christ. And as I got to thinking about that passage that Pastor Josh assigned to me for this message, I got to thinking, there are a variety of ways that the word share can be used. I wonder how many different ways the word share is used in Scripture. Because sometimes when we think of sharing, we think of what we hope our kids do on Christmas morning when they open their presents, and they share them with their siblings. Does that happen? Just spontaneously with all of you. Your children, immediately upon opening a gift, they go, I can't wait to share this with my brother. That new Xbox, that's going to be used by everybody. Or, that's mine, keep your hands off. <laughs> right? Or the word share to participate in something together. Let's look at the various ways that the word share is used in Scripture before we get to the final point that I want to share is the dissemination of good news. There are various meanings of the word share in Scripture. The first one is found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 11 through 12, and it means to share a portion of the whole. To share a portion of the whole. For example, like a portion of the inheritance that the prodigal son got when he asked the father for it. He didn't get the whole inheritance. He got a portion of it. And it tells us in that story that he shared in it. And it also tells us, for example, like we use the word to share the bill when we go to a restaurant. We call it Dutch treat. You know, or you pay for your own, or if, you, if you've got a whole bunch of people and they put the bill down in the middle and you start passing it around and say, you pay your share. You're sharing in a part of the whole. Colossians 1, 11 through 14 says this, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The fascinating thing about thinking about the share that we get of inheritance is this. We know from the triune nature of God that three unique individuals in eternity are able to share the Godhead while each having all of it. Don't let your mind go crazy thinking about that. They share in the Godhead while they each have all of it. I want you to just, as a side note, consider that as your inheritance in glory. You're not getting a portion of the inheritance that Jesus has for all of us in eternity. You will be an eternal being at that point. You get to share in all of it. 
meaning that you are an owner of all of it. What good news. Secondly, the word share in Scripture means to hold in common or be a co-participant, as our text told us today. Therefore, in Hebrews 3.1, you brothers, holy brothers, share in a heavenly calling. We share in Christ. It's also used of by Paul in the book of Galatians when he describes the grafting in of the Gentiles as the branch of an olive tree so that we all now share in the nourishment that comes from the root who is Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews back in chapter 2 says this, that, that God shared in humanity Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. God shared in humanity. That means to hold in common and to be a co-participant. Jesus, fully God, fully human, sharing in our existence. Thirdly, the word share in Scripture means this, to distribute resources to others, to distribute resources to others. Here's some examples of how that's used in Scripture. I'm not going to make specific points about them. The Scripture is clear how you should apply these to your own life. 1 Timothy 6, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Paul also says in Galatians 6.6, 6, the people of the church who are being taught the scripture are to distribute financial support to the teacher. Paul says specifically, he said, those who are teaching you the scriptures are worthy of you investing your resources in them so that they can focus only on the teaching of the scriptures and their leadership and you pay their way through life. You share your resources with God's people in the church. And in Ephesians 4.28, we're told to personally work hard so that we have financial resources to distribute to people in need. For God so loved the world that he gave. And having come under God's love, we give. The fourth example of sharing in scripture is to actually give yourself to someone else. In 1 Thessalonians 2.8, we read this, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. The sharing of yourself I was thrilled this morning to have somebody come up to me and say, I am so ready and excited to get involved in some form of ministry here at Calvary. I want to give of my skills and my efforts and my energy so that I can serve God in this church to share yourself with others. The final aspect of sharing that I found in Scripture is to is in the context of this to disseminate information to actually pass on the good news to share the good news with somebody else unfortunately the context of disseminating information isn't always good news it's also gossip because see the context of using that word share can equally be applied to the positive aspects of good news as it can to the negative aspects of bad news about other people. So let me just say this. 
We're not going to talk about gossip because gossip is a sin, and I'm not here to talk about our sin today. I'm talking about our Savior. So we're going to shed the light so brightly, as Charles Spurgeon said, that sin fades away and all we see is the light of the good news. But let me tell you this also. If you're a gossip, quit it. (laughs) It's sin. If you say something about another person that you would not be willing to say directly to their face about them, then you have sinned if you tell another person about that. You are a gossip. If you make an innuendo, an accusation, anything about another person before talking to that person first, you are living in sin. But let's talk about the sharing of the good news. I know it's halfway through the sermon already, but stand with me as we read Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, The shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. You may be seated. How many of you have downloaded the app to your phone already as I have for The Chosen? Very good. The Twin Cities are on top of it. Oh, there's one over there too. We have guests over here today from the Twin Cities. Um, Guys, go to your app store, download the app, The Chosen. Then you can use your phone to cast it to your TV. It'll go through Roku, it'll go through Vimeo, it'll go through YouTube, it'll go... Whatever you have on your television, you can cast it to your television. There are eight episodes already in season one that are a very realistic, true-to-life depiction of the life of Christ. And the very first introductory video is called The Shepherd. It introduces the birth of Jesus. And my wife and I watched it on Friday night and I quickly contacted our IT department and I said, can I get a portion of that video to use in my sermon on Sunday? And he, after checking it all out, he said, no, because it's fully copyrighted and we'll get our broadcast shut down if we try to put it up there. So we're obeying the copyright laws. You can watch it for yourself. It's the story of a shepherd And I'll make it brief. It's a story of a shepherd who brings a lamb to the market to be sold to the Pharisees for sacrifice in the temple. But his lamb is not spotless. And he is kicked out of the marketplace and disdained in front of everyone else. And when he returns with the other shepherds to the field, the glory of God appears and tells them about the birth of Jesus, and they run. There's parts of the story I'm leaving out on purpose because you have to watch it to see what really happens, but they run to Bethlehem, and they find Mary and Joseph and the baby, and they worship him. And then they say this, we must go quickly because everyone must know. 
We must go quickly because everyone must know. And as they're going, this shepherd comes face to face with the Pharisee that had kicked him out of the marketplace. And this Pharisee says, you were told never to come back here again until you had found a spotless lamb for sacrifice. Have you found one? And the video ends with the shepherd simply having a glorified smile on his face because he had found the spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Have you found him? Do you share him? Because everybody must know. So there are several things that I see in this story that help us to understand our great privilege we have to share the good news. First of all, good news conquers fear. Good news conquers fear. When the angels appeared, they, they were one of many, as Miss Christina shared with our children this morning, they were one of many in the line that had proclaimed the coming of the Messiah, either prophetically or now for the first time in actual happening. The angels came to share good news with the shepherd and they said, this good news is so great that it will alleviate all your fears. Have you let the fear of sharing the good news conquer the joy of the good news? Are you living in fear that others will react in a poor way to sharing the good news with them? The good news conquers fear. Secondly, there is no gooder news than the gospel. There's no better news than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what the angels said in the text? They said, fear not. For I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for who? Who said that? Say it louder. All people. The good news is for all people. So let me ask you a question. What one single condition shared by the entire human race can be solved by one piece of good news. Thank you. The sin problem. We all share in the sin problem. We are all co-participants of the sin problem. But there is good news for all all people with the same condition and the only condition that is equally shared by every, every human being ever born except Jesus is sin. So there is good news that will conquer the one condition that causes death. The death of Jesus Christ for your forgiveness and your salvation. This good news is for all people. Thirdly, great enthusiasm should accompany the good news. Great enthusiasm. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. I have been told frequently over my career as a Baptist preacher that I was born into the wrong denomination. <clears throat> Why is it that we are so staunch and stiff and stuffy about our response to the good news? I mean, now, I'm, I'm not advocating jumping up in the middle of a service and disrupting the service for the sake of you dancing and hopping around and shouting and all the rest. But I'll tell you what, there's nothing like a good hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord. And great enthusiasm should accompany the good news. Fourthly, good news will produce 
determined activity. Determined activity. The shepherds immediately upon hearing the news said, let us go, and they went with haste. They were determined to get there and put into their own experience bank the knowledge that they had just been given. Good news produces determined activity. You remember the question I had at the beginning of, the, of, of, the, of our time together? Think about the best news you've ever heard, and then how long did it take you to want to share that with somebody? And has the thrill of that news worn off that you don't care to share it with anybody anymore? And if that statement is true of the good news of Jesus in your life, it's time to get on your knees in prayer with the Scripture and refresh yourself with the joy of your salvation and start sharing the good news and do it with a determined spirit. Fifthly, the good news motivates bold sharing. In this video that I watched on Friday night, the shepherds ran from the major uh, from the manger into the city and every single person that they could touch or bump into or see, they shouted out the good news that Jesus has been born. They boldly went where many of us would never dare to go. And the question that you must ask is, why would I not dare to go there? They made known this news to everyone with whom they had contact. And then, good news produces lasting praise. The shepherds returned back to the fields. And when they did, they continued to glorify and praise God for all they had heard and seen. Good news produces lasting praise. And maybe the reason is that the praise and the sharing of your salvation has taken a back seat to other aspects of your life is that you've determined that those other aspects are gooder than the good news. And if you're still hung up on the poor grammar of that statement, then your mind needs to be refreshed by the Holy Spirit right now. What have you determined in your life is of more value than your salvation in Christ? And why is your salvation in Christ the least likely thing for you to talk about when you're with other people? Let the Holy Spirit change our hearts. The final point is this from this story of the shepherds. Good news is precisely repeatable. Good news is precisely repeat. Do we, there it is. It never needs to be embellished. Did you see the statement uh, that was made about the shepherds? They returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. No need to embellish the gospel. We don't need to figure out a new package to put the gospel in so that more people from the world are attracted to it. We don't need to figure out a way to do ministry a little bit differently so that it might not be so offensive to people. We simply proclaim what we have heard and seen and is true about our lives. We were separated from Christ for all eternity by our sin. God sent Christ to pay for our sin. In Christ, we have now been forgiven for our sin. In Christ, we now have eternal life and it can never be taken away from me. Very good. You don't have to embellish that to anybody, except, except if you don't really believe that it's sufficient. 
If you don't really believe the simple truth of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for your sin, if you don't believe the simple truth that you are the sinner for whom Christ needed to die, if you don't believe firmly that there is only one way to the Father and that's through Jesus Christ our Lord, if you don't believe those things as sufficient, then you will embellish that truth with ways to cover up your own disbelief. The good news is precisely repeatable. Our challenge is to go and repeat it. Share the good news. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this study of sharing. And today, Lord, out there in the internet world, or even in here in this facility, people are recognizing that they share in the sinfulness that has condemned them to eternal death. And that only Christ can cause them to share in eternal life and the inheritance with all the saints. Father, if there's anyone still sharing in the inheritance of sin, Let this be the day by faith that they come to Jesus for the forgiveness of their sin. And for all of us who know you, refresh us with your Holy Spirit with the joy of our salvation so that we are willing to go and tell it on the mountains. Please stand. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching for silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy Christ is born. The shepherds fear and tremble when low above the earth rang out the angels' chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. That blessed Christmas morn Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born, that Jesus Christ is born, that Jesus Christ is born. The last words we know that Jesus spoke personally to his disciples were these, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Fear not. Go share the good news. God bless you. You're dismissed.